Hello, my name is Julie Rogers Bascom, and I'm the Director of Training and Leadership Development at the National Youth Leadership Council, NYLC. You are about to hear a webinar, which was recorded in May 2020, with six amazing young people, where six amazing young people will describe what they did when their school in Edina, Minnesota, went to distance learning in the spring of 2020. This is a small group of young leaders who address issues within the school community. They, have also, they also have a group of about 300 fellow students who take part in community service opportunities, leading tours for new students and families, and making videos to alert the, the student body about issues, events, or practical strategies like studying for midterm and finals. They are the responders to community issues in and around their school. The issue that they were most concerned about last spring was the impact that social isolation would have on them and their classmates. We used the service learning process of IPARD, which is investigation, planning and preparing, action, reflection, and demonstration to take action on their concerns. You'll hear how they started with learning more about what the impacts could be without starting out with a project in mind. Their investigation really informed what kind of action they would take. After the webinar is over and you want to get an update on their actions, reach out to me at jrbascom at nylc.org. I'd love to hear how you are engaging in virtual service learning. So welcome to our webinar this morning on virtual service learning. Um, I'm really excited to be able to welcome an amazing group of young people from Adina Public Schools, the Adina 212 Leadership Group. I want to thank them so much for, um, for being um, presenting with us this morning. And of course, welcoming Julie Rogers Bassum from NYLC and from Adina Schools. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. And I'm gonna step back and say, take it over guys, share, share with us your knowledge and expertise. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Amy. I appreciate the opportunity to highlight the really good and important work that this group of young people are doing. I am really honored to call them my partners. They will sometimes call me their advisor, but I really view myself as, as a partner, and I think that's one of the important elements of quality service learning is to partner with young people. We're going to be talking today about virtual service learning. Um, as Amy said, my name is Julie Rogers Bascom. I am the Director of Training and Leadership Development at, e at uh, MILC, and I also have been working in the Public Schools for many years using service and civic learning to engage young people. And we'll be learning more about the e 212 Leadership Group in a minute. I want to thank these young people for what they are going to be sharing with all of us, but also for this amazing year of um, important work. Just, an, just a quick aside about um, uh, the National Youth Leadership Council. NYLC is a, a national group located here in St. Paul. We've been around for 35 plus years, and, and our goal is really to engage young people to become um, active citizens um, by engaging in service learning during their K-12 years. We do that in three ways. We develop leaders, young leaders. You'll be hearing from some um, today. We um, support service learning practitioners. After you're done with this webinar, which we will be posting, take a look at some of the other resources on our web page. We have um, webinars, we have forms, we have videos, we have lots of information that might help you with your service learning practice. We're also working to advance the field. There's been um, a resurgence in civic education and service learning, and we're excited to be partnering with other people around the country to really make this a, a strategy that young people and teachers can become involved. Now, before I introduce um, um, some of the young people, I want to um, um, have a couple of housekeeping questions. Um, 
If you have some questions, please use the Q&A function on the uh, toolbar, on the Zoom toolbar. If you're having trouble with connections um, or um, uh, something, you can use the chat box. We also will be doing a Slido survey, two, two different um, exchanges, uh, engagement strategies. Um, so you will need your cell phone if you have a QR code, or you can use a window. You can open up a new window and you can go to Slido.com. So just a precursor to that. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to ask Carter. Carter, where are you? Uh, Carter, um, what does leadership mean to you? And then tell us a little bit about the two ball group. Oh, um, so leadership to me is looking up and supporting other people to um, try to get to a common goal and to make change in any way possible. Yeah, and that's basically what the 212 Leadership Group at Edina High School does. Um, Edina is a sub right outside Minneapolis, for those who don't know. Um, we connect students with the community inside and outside of the school with service events, um, with local um, charities and different places, as well as in school where we um, help them to become their leaders. Uh, we, the six of us are cabinet, so we um, plan these events and um, are the ones who are kind of in charge of everything. So we do meet, the six of us meet during the school day, and so it's a class for us, and we, so we have a lot of time to develop ourselves as leaders and play events. Um, another thing that you guys might be wondering about is our name, where does 212 come from? It come from um, just saying about how at 211 degrees, water is just hot, but at 212 degrees, it boils, and that one degree of difference can make some steam, and steam can power a train. So it's just come off of like just any part bit of change is good. So that's what we try to do. No matter how small, we try to make change in our community. And that's what you call us. Every um uh, every act of service is an act of peace. Thank you, Carter. Thank you. Um now is our first opportunity to talk um to you about or for us to learn who is in the audience right now. So either uh, hover your QR code reader into that left corner box, scan that code, or go to uh, uh, Slido, S-L-I-B-O, and it'll ask you for a code. And I'm going to move this here. The code is 8301. So I see somebody has been able to, um, okay, we're seeing some other people showing their, um, who they are. We have some youth workers, we have a uh, higher ed teacher or administrator, we have some students, fabulous. We love it when students are with us uh, so we can share in our knowledge and um, create more partnerships. See some K-12 teachers and some caring adults, fabulous. We'll give it one more minute. Now, just um, a, a, a background question. 212, have any of you led a webinar before? Yeah, first one. First one. Terrific. Terrific. Well, you're doing a great, great job so far. I appreciate that. I see youth workers. We uh, understand that service learning can be a strategy in out-of-school programs as well. When we talk about learning outcomes, we also talk about we talk about academic outcomes. We talk about civic and um, uh, character and leadership skills. So it looks like there is a lot of youth workers and a lot of K-12 teachers. All right, thanks so much. I'm going to close down this. Five, four, three, two, one. There we go. So, Artie, Artie Graham, how are you staying in touch with your friends these days? And how does the project that we're going to be talking to how does that relate to that? Okay, so um, the main way I've been staying in contact with friends is um, te using technology and connecting virtually over platforms such as Zoom, FaceTime, and other um, meeting spaces. And regarding the project, they are all related to staying connected to self isolation. Now, can you tell me a little bit about how we got started? I mean, we started talking about you know, distance learning. Any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, so originally, like Carter uh, said earlier, we meet 
twice a week with Julian in person. However, after COVID-19, we had to transition to uh, meeting online and work. Uh, initially prepared for going completely online with us being a service group because it was kind of hard for us to find different ways to engage in virtual service line. So we really had to take some time and play with it and try to figure out what that would look like. And we did have some concerns about how we would find volunteers for virtual service and what different versions of uh, virtual service would look like. But luckily we found different ways we could serve our community. Um, so. so we really started with the issue. We started with um, uh, what are some of your concerns about distance learning and being in isolation? So that's where we started. We actually did not start with the project, although we had some ideas, but we really took a, 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 a moment to pause and think about the issue because that allowed us to be a little bit more creative than some of the ideas that we came up with. I want to review real quickly um, our four stages of service learning. Now, the six young people in the um, 212 cabinet, they're engaged in service learning because they're engaged in the whole process. Many of the people, the young people who will be engaged in some of the action, I would say that they are having a community service experience. Both are good and important work, but right now we were focusing on developing leadership skills. In, in and for the, the young people that I'm working with right now. So, um, real quickly, four stages. First stage is um, determine, um, you know, what are your hope for outcomes. Second stage is determining acceptable evidence. What does it look like if you reach that outcome? Third stage, you probably, if you've been engaged in service learning, you've heard about the i hard cycle, and that's really where the student learning comes into play. And that fourth stage is self-assessment. What went well, what, what needed to change, what still needs to be done. So real quickly, I'm going to go over a little bit about identifying desired results. What were our hope for results? Um, oftentimes, this is where the teacher or youth worker or the um, caring adult identifies what it is that they're hoping um, young people will be able to do or, or express. Um, so I actually, in this regard, I ask the young people, I ask our captain, what, is, what are you hoping to, to achieve? And I, I love some of the things that they talked about. He talked about I, I, he wanted to be more connected with other people, even though I can't physically see them. That was their hope for outcome. That was his hope for outcome in this process. Emily talked about feeling like they're still making a difference despite having to do it virtually and from home. So again, we started with what did we want to accomplish? They also talked a little bit about what they want for their community. Parker said he wanted to preserve the sense of community even when we can't see each other. So by engaging young people in desired results um, uh, helped fuel the, the action. So if you're a teacher, a teacher, this is where you would put your standards. If you're a youth worker, this is where you would put some of those um, youth outcomes that you're looking for. The second stage, real quickly, is determining acceptable evidence. Now, if you are a K-12 teacher, this is where you would be doing some assessments and you'd be thinking about how to measure. But I ask young people, what is it that you, how will you know that you determined that you reached your hope for outcome? Theo talked about he'd be interacting with people more digitally. Emily thought that um, we'd be uh, more positive because we feel like we're positively impacting the community. So those are, uh, um, I will also refer you on the NYLC website, we have a document that leads you through, that guides you through those four stages. It's called the Service Learning Educator Handbook. Uh, it's under the Service Learning uh, Resources on our webpage. So that's stage one and stage two. Yeah, notice that we didn't start with the project. We really started with some of the background thinking. So stage three is, as I mentioned, it's really that I part cycle. Investigation, planning, and preparing action, reflection, demonstration. We have been doing investigation, and hopefully we'll be talking a little bit about that um, in, a, in a minute. We are off, we many of us, right now are still in that planning and preparation stage. So I would say that our actions are not complete, but we have been doing reflection on, uh, around all the different steps. Uh, we also, which is different 
in, the, in our particular group, we have multiple actions that are going on. And um, likely, I'd like you to I have a question for you first. What kind of leader are you? And how did we go about investigating the issue? Um, so I think there's a common misconception about leadership and that people who are assertive and the loudest people in the room are necessarily the best leaders. But one of the most important things that I learned through 212 is that there are so many different kinds of leaders. So in the first month of 212, we took a leadership compass quiz. And so I found out that I was predominantly a self leader and a little bit of an ease leader. So that means that I was able to connect well with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis rather than necessarily leading such a big group of people. And also as an ease leader, I'm able to think creatively about things and also an idea. So each of us are able to take our own strengths as different kinds of leaders and to discuss the different impacts of social isolation. So for the different impacts we noticed that mental health was one of the biggest concerns that we noticed. And we also noticed that a lot of social interaction should also affect your sleep cycle and it can make you feel cooped up with a lot of exercise. So then the most important thing that we decided to do was to address this issue as a whole and to see what we could do in a community to make us feel more connected. So some of the things that we came up with were posting Zen quotes on our Twitter page or creating an Instagram that posts decision day future plans for seniors because we wouldn't be on school for decision day. And we also came up with a blog on a website for each of us to post about things that we're doing during social isolation to make us feel more connected to our community. And we're also creating a video to show gratitude to our teachers. And we think that through these actions, that we'll be able to create more connections within our community. And even though we're all separated, we'll still feel united as a whole. Thank you. I think what was so remarkable about really taking that step of investigating is that each one of the 212 cabinet members came up with different ideas. I know Michael is really interested in the medicine and medical kinds of things. And so her perspective, perspective was really valuable because that might not be where I would have gone. Thank you, Michael. Nice. The next state step in the IPAR process is the planning and preparation phase. And this is really important because it helps us go to from ready, set, go. Many, many of us, myself included, will go, oh, got an idea, let's just go do it. So we're really, and again, as I mentioned, this is where many of us are right now in this whole process. We're doing the planning and preparation. And Theo, um, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about um, uh, what you think makes a good leader and then share about how we're planning and preparing right now. So I really think that the defining character trait of any successful leader is a lack of selfishness. Because ultimately, a leader is supposed to be leading others. So the focus should never be on yourself. You should really be thinking about how all the people around you can be supported and how they can reach their goals. Um, so uh, moving on to planning and preparation. We have really been doing a ton of stuff. We have a bunch of different projects we're working on simultaneously, and each of us is kind of taking an individual role with each of them. So I'm not going to go too in-depth about what all the projects are because we're going to be talking about that next. But we have been looking at new functionality on our website to figure out how we can do blog posts. We have contacted the owner of an Instagram account, and we have figured out how to standardize Instagram posts for it. We've been trying to find volunteers for a variety of different uh, activities, including shooting video, doing pen pals, and figuring out how to read books to preschoolers. And we have also been trying to figure out uh, really a good way for us to stay involved on a website with mental health as well. So not only have we been writing blog posts, We've been wanting to include mental health tips so that people can get some advice if they're feeling down or if they feel like, you know, psychologically they're being harmed by quarantine and social isolation. Thank you. Thank you. You can see this is a very, very active, very active group. Um, 
uh, and we really paused to try to build some partnerships with other groups. We had uh, originally talked about making videos and, and or, or actually we were thinking about having live conversation with young people, with younger people, with books. But we really found that that, was, that could be a barrier and, and we wanted to be um, honored our the Edina uh, safety codes. So we had to switch gears a, a little bit. So we're making videos instead of that live connection. So we partnered with other people and other agencies, which is again one of those standards of quality service learning. Julie, before you move on from planning and preparation, I think we have a question here that fits nicely um, with that stage of my part. Uh, so could you guys speak just a little bit to how you developed um, this webinar? Was it through Zoom? Um, you know, what kind of tools or resources did you use um, in your planning and preparation of, of this session? So we usually use a Google Meet platform when we meet together on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. But we collaborated, we knew that um, NYLC uses Zoom. So, um, Carter, do you want to talk a little bit about how we divided up the tasks? Yeah. So when we were dividing up the tasks, usually we would like, we brainstorm ideas as a group. And then to really get like the details of each thing, we would then like just volunteer about which one we wanted to, each person wanted to focus on. So that's kind of how we um, divided up the service. And we did, we did a lot of stuff on our own, with like filling out Google documents and like taking notes and like finding information for ourselves with communication, just so that it wasn't either all loaded on one person or it felt like someone wasn't doing anything. Mm -hmm. So we all kind of shared the load of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I just said to follow up on that, I think some of it was individual action, but I also think some of it were, was collaborative. And maybe that's a good segue into the action. Does anybody want to talk a little bit about some of the act, a little bit more about some of the actions that we're taking? Um, particularly, um, I'm thinking about Carter and Theo, you all were doing the, the blog and the Instagram, and you were kind of collaborating on the tech stuff. Yeah, uh, our goal with the blog posts were to, we were, we were also working with that with mental health because that was there to um, just show how we've been getting through the um, stay at home and all that stuff, just uh, and how it's affected us and what we've been doing to stay active and to stay positive during the time. So we're going to incorporate that with the mental health and I think we're going to talk about Instagram too, about how we use that to um, spread positivity. Mm -hmm. So the Instagram account was actually started by a different student at EHS who was not associated with 212. Um, and so he was trying to figure out how we could uh, recognize where people are going to be going to college because none of us were actually in school for decision day or when a lot of kids actually were making their decisions for where they were going to go. So um, it was just a really nice idea to have people be able to say, this is what I'm looking forward to in my future. People could connect with others if they were going to the same school, or even if they were going to different schools, people could say, you know, congratulations, I know you really want to get in. And uh, I think the person who started the Instagram account quickly realized that he was in over his head, because we were getting like hundreds of DMs with people asking us to post their college. So uh, we had just kind of took it over, obviously with this person's consent. And uh, we standardized all the Instagram posts, and in the end, it was a huge success. I would say that definitely the majority of our grade is on this Instagram account, if not more. So uh, it's just been really great. As I've been seeing a ton of people like putting our posts on their stories and you know celebrating with each other about everybody's future plans. So it's just a really good way for people to focus on what they have to look forward to instead of, you know, being frustrated with their current situation. And then we also, um, one of the things that we all, we are a school sanctioned group. So we made sure that we, that it was sanctioned by administration. Who did you talk to, Theo? Who, who were some of the people that you and Carter interfaced with? Make sure that this was 
Yeah, so we talked with um, a couple of the counselors because they are very heavily involved with the seniors and um, college process. And also um, one of the um, vice, vice principals because we um, they were helped a lot with 12 and just having somebody in administration know what we're doing and support it was something that was important to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Thanks, size. Um, Mike, I believe you want to talk a little bit about the pen, pen pal effort. Is there anything more you'd like to talk about that with that? Yeah, so we reached out to the Edina Community Education Program and we found out that they were partnering with the Senior Center and with the Edina Library to create this sort of intergenerational pen pal program. The one thing that we did was that we created a spreadsheet with people where people could pull their information and their interests to send to um, these coordinators so that they could link them up with a person from any age so that they could participate in the pen pal program. So again, another opportunity for us to build partnerships and for the greater community to see uh, the impact that young people can have. It's not, oh, those young people, it's, oh, those young people. Um, uh, Margo, do you want to talk a little bit about reading videos? What's the, what's the thought behind the videos? Yeah, so another project that we're working on is trying to reach out to the younger community and elementary schoolers. So we thought it would be a good idea to try to do some virtual reading buddy system. But we thought for the concern of safety, like a parent would probably have to be on the Zoom or whatever platform we would use to call. So we thought that we could do just videos, take videos of ourselves reading books, and send them into a website still kind of being figured out. And we contacted the volunteer coordinator of Dina, so she has been helping us out with that. But yeah, we just wanted to reach out to the younger community because we know that they're definitely confused at these times and they want to just see other faces other than their parents or teachers or whoever they're being with right now. And I also think uh, they look up to um, older people, and you're also helping to break the, the image of teens, you know, so you're becoming a little bit more approachable. I think your, your mom was involved, uh, so she might be able to give us some support as well. To say just a bit about that. Um, yeah, so she's a para at Creek Valley Elementary School, and she works in one of the kindergarten classrooms, and she has been taking video, videos of herself reading children's books for her kinder, kindergartners, and they love it, and they send back little recordings of themselves, like saying, thank you, Mrs. Prescott, we love your story. And so I think it would just be fun for them to see some other faces other than my mom and their teacher, so, yeah. Oh, Julia, you're muted, I think. Thanks, Margo. I, um, uh, what I, I love is that we look at different things around our world and we see how we can adjust and make it relevant and be of service. I think, Emily, are you going to talk a little bit about um, some of your work around the mental health issues? Yeah, um, we have, we're not too far into this effort yet, but we have um, start a blog post, first of all, and um, I know some of the other members have been working hard on that, but with the blog post where we were going to, it was kind of a check-in to see how people were doing and to, like, show what we were doing to stay positive and everything like that, and we wanted to pair that with awareness for mental health, so we're finding articles and, you know, awareness um, surrounding mental health issues because we know that, um, it can be hard to stay in a good place mentally during um, the, these like uncertain, unknown times. So we wanted to make sure that and we think it's even more necessary now than ever to make sure we're still checking in with people and staying positive. So we wanted to bring awareness to any of the mental health effects and things like that. So we're working on efforts with that. Great. And Artie, um, tell us a little bit about your thoughts of the video that you are working on with um, CDO. Okay. So pretty much uh, we're doing a gratitude video for the class of 2020 because we were kind of, we're going to be missing out on the opportunity to kind of get that closure from high school. 
So this particular effort, what we'll be doing is we're getting um, student volunteers to say um, one of three things, either some that are grateful for from, grateful for from high school, something that they learned, or some that they missed from high school, and then if there's any particular staff member that they might miss, and then we're going to be making a compilation and sharing that with the district. Just so teachers can get a chance to make some of their favorite students just saying thank you one more time or saying goodbye. It would be a nice little thing that people can look back to and see it all over. Thanks. Thank you, Marty. So we're busy. We are very, 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 very busy. Um, the next stage uh, is um, that we talk about in our service learning process is reflection. Um, Margo is going to tell us a little bit about reflection, um, but one of the things that I want to add is that reflection is something that goes on before, during, and after this. And Mar they all would probably say, oh, Julie asks all these questions all the time. Um, but before we talk about that, Margo, how, tell us a little bit about how Eden High School changed instruction to um, from in-person to distance learning. Yeah, so for our Edena's distance learning process, the, our teachers will post ABAs, they're called attendance-based assignments, on our school page, which is the platform we use to complete those assignments, and they'll, they'll post them at 9 in the morning, and we'll have to complete them by 5 p.m. to get our attendance counted for, and we will either have asynchronous or synchronous classes, and Asynchronous are just classes that will do our own just work that you can submit at any time. But synchronous classes are when the teacher will set an exact time that you have to be on a live, like, Google Hangout is what we use, or a live um, quiz that is timed in a certain amount of time. So, yeah. Great. Now tell us a little bit about how we reflected during our process. Yeah, so for reflection, we answered a lot of questions, like Julie said, on the spreadsheets about just our concerns, hopes, and thoughts about this process of social or social isolation and distance learning through all of this and service. So, for example, we talked about getting through this distance learning and how we can help each other and ourselves with that and how to do service virtually, because obviously that was a very different environment for us to figure out and helping different age groups, which is what we really wanted to focus on. So we started out every meeting on our Tuesdays and Thursdays with a question about how we were feeling and just what was important for us to work on that day. And to keep normalcy, we continued to meet two days a week like we did during the normal school year on Tuesdays and Thursdays to reflect on just what was important to us and what we wanted to work on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now is an opportunity for all of us um, listening uh, to uh, uh, reflect. So my question to you in this poll is what are three words that reflect your thoughts on virtual service learning? So again, you can go to slido.com, type in, type in that code, A301, and, or you can hover over the corner, the top left corner, uh, and that will take you to uh, the, the poll. So what three words are you thinking of that reflect your thoughts on virtual service learning? So what will happen is that this will create a word cloud. So there's one. Meaningful, enriching, eye-opening. Okay, thank you. A meaningful, yes, effective, thoughtful. Community, I really think that one of the things that was important for me um, uh, in this process was to continue that relationship building. And I have a slide a little later on that talks about um, uh, how relationships, how we build relationships. And that was one of the things that we kept reflecting on. Oh, these are great. But we kept reflect, reflecting on, um, on um, how we could stay together and stay connected and what that was something important, um, the relationship aspect of this. Powerful, effective, important, innovative, challenging. Yes, it's challenging. And I would love to be able to figure out how to do the, the two total group. The, the larger group is about 250 kids. Is that what we figured out, guys? About 250 kids? Give or take. Um, I'd love to be able to do this with more, but 
the, the, my capacity to, to do that. I, I haven't figured it out yet. So this is fabulous. Thank you. Meaningful, innovative, difficult, yes. Questions, creativity. I would say all of these young people that are on your screen right now have been very creative and you're seeing a collaborative effort. So some of those outcomes, the team building, 21st century skills, social emotional learning, you're seeing that come out in this, in, in their words and, and their thoughts. So I'm going to move to our next slide. Thank you very much. That was really um, reinforcing for all of us. Um, Carter, um, I'm going to ask you a little bit of, uh, in, a, in a minute what demonstration is, is of that last stage where we share with the community what we did, how we serve. Now, we haven't, we are not at this point quite yet, but I, so I'm going to ask Carter, have you done any kind of demonstration uh, of what you've learned before, and then what are some of our plans to demonstrate what we've done? Yeah. So use a lot of the demonstration that we've done so far this year with 12 has been sharing with um, the people who do the service and like the results of it, we like to share with them. We like to share with the administration just so they know what we're doing and what we're doing is uh, meaningful. And we like to share it on our Twitter and just to the public so that people know what we're doing. Um, with our projects right now with virtual service learning, um, one of the big things that we're doing with demonstration is this webinar. Um, just sharing that we were able to do virtual source learning and do it successfully, and that's what we like doing. Um, with Instagram, we shared it with the counselors and the vice principals of school just to, and they like talked with us about it and they got some tips and helped out with it. And they also um, posted it on their the social medias for the school too, just to like, give out to the larger community. So that was a big part of that is just sharing, sharing with the community what we're doing. Um, with the mental health stuff, we want to demonstrate what we're doing with that with our the members of the 12 and with, like when we involve them with some of the community service things that we're doing, like the reading buddies and pen pals, we also want to say, hey, here's some mental health resources if you need them, especially during this hard time. So that's just how we've, we haven't gotten to this step as much yet with everything, so this is how we plan to demonstrate it, so yeah. Great, thank you, thank you. It's, it will be virtual. It will be a virtual demonstration rather than some of the other things that we've done where we have we might have a, a service fair kind of thing where we experience, where we share what we've learned. So we have pictures of um, um, some of the media. I would imagine there will be some articles, some newspaper articles, whether it be local or in, I'm sure that we'll do something on the NYLC blog about this as well. Um, so the next, the next, Step the you know talk about the stages of service learning one two three. This fourth step is really about self-assessment. What did you do well? What did what did we learn collectively? What still needs to be done? I'm going to ask Emily um, a question. What do you think during these last six weeks or maybe seven weeks now? What's been the surprising silver lining in uh, in our situation? And then what did you learn from this experience so far that you didn't know before? Um, I think the biggest silver lining is that people have realized how much they value being connected to others and have come to appreciate it more. So I feel like that's helped us get a lot more support for our efforts because people are really eager to stay connected with each other and to do what they can for their community. And I mean, I've seen people be a lot more generous and understanding during this time. Um, and when we first started virtual service learning, we were confused and nervous about how it could work. But I think one thing we learned was that it's not only very possible, but also really necessary during this time, even more so than normal. Um, because this is a really important time to, for example, check up on people, and that's why we're doing efforts with mental health and to just stay connected, which is why we're doing reading buddies and our Instagram page with the um, colleges for seniors to support them um, and our other service efforts. So I think the biggest thing that we've learned is that through like collaborative work and um, creativity that service learning virtually definitely is possible. 
Thanks. Thank you. So I just wanted to um, a shout out the Search Institute and their work on building relationships because that has been um, a real foundation of the work that uh, I am engaged in um, with the, this fabulous group of, of young people. I think we demonstrated that we shared power. We demonstrated that there was expression of care and that we were providing support for each other. Um, we expanded some possibilities. You know, we could have started with a project, but instead we went to those other steps of investigating and planning and preparing. And I don't know, would you say that some of these things were challenging, guys? Some of them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Maybe even this webinar is challenging. Yeah. So here's the time that I would invite people uh, to ask questions. I don't have the Q&A box on my screen, but I mean, if there are some other questions, uh, the group would love to uh, give more feedback. We do have lots of questions in the chat, Julie, too. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, so we can just start at the top. Okay. Well, why don't you guys, I don't see those online, so why don't you go ahead okay. and... Yeah, we can answer those. Yeah. Here, let me help. Um, so, um, I think we have a uh, quite a large group um, from uh, who represent libraries, and they wanted to um, have you expand just a little bit on that project, um, how you partnered with the public library, um, um, especially around the reading of stories. Can you guys speak just a little bit more to that? Yeah, so we're still kind of working on that project. We hadn't got, got completely figured out, and we hadn't um, actually partnered with the public library at all. We were just um, thinking of reading books of our own that we had childhood books that like we think are appropriate and good for the kindergartners or whoever we were reading the books to, but we weren't planning on help or partnering with the public library, so but we could check that out too. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. I know that we talked with t some teachers and they've given recommendations. One of our barriers, and those of you who are the librarians out there, we would love some of your, of your feedback. One of the barriers is that our libraries are closed. So, um, but that's really a great uh, uh, information for us to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Margo. Good answer. Now, I think um, you all might have answered this, but are you meeting secrets? <laughs> Synchronously every day, or um, how, what does your meeting schedule look like? Um, well, during the school week, um, normally before we started doing online learning, we were meeting with Julie on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then on the other days of the week, um, we were just meeting just the students. So to kind of honor that and try to keep some normalcy, we've been meeting on Tuesdays and Thursdays synchronously with Julie, and then on the other days we've been working on our own projects or completing Google Docs together, things like that. So quick, like, how do you keep yourself motivated um, to do the work when you're not coming together? Like, what is it that really inspires you or engages you or like keeps you coming back um well i think our meetings on tuesday and thursday are really good and just keeping us on track and motivated like definitely i do agree that like when it's just us on our own on mondays wednesdays and fridays we don't feel as motivated to do work but we also have a group that one with just the six of us someone else would do we but we constantly keep each other updated on what we're working on. So I think that's definitely a good way to stay connected and also stay focused on our project. So kind of along those same lines, um, would you say more or less technology? Like, I think we're all looking for the best app, the best platform, the, like, more things to engage. Like, does it get overwhelmed? Like, are you like, okay, enough with technology, let's just land on something? Or are you excited or motivated by more or different technology? 
I'd say we're definitely motivated by it. Um, we do like using technology um, as young people, and we've been using a lot of different things from Zoom to Google Hangouts to Google Drive um, to YouTube, and all of these um, are just fun to learn how to use and try to figure out ways to incorporate the best into um, our search learning projects. And I feel like a lot of them really do fit well with what we're doing, and we're able to incorporate perfectly into it. Wonderful. Thank you. I would, add, I would add one comment about uh, uh, the composition of this group. Last year, they were chosen by the outgoing cabinet. So the last year's cabinet looked at what were some of the skills needed to take this um, group and move it to the next level. And they all came together and made some of you guys. You're all there in very different social groups and have different strengths and um, interests. Did anybody talk about what that felt like to come together as um, very uh, diverse, with very diverse personalities and experiences? Yeah, at, uh, um, at first it was, we didn't, like, at the very beginning, we didn't know each other very well. And, like, it was kind of like, oh, is this really going to work? But as we like started doing service and planning things, we realized that we all are pretty different, like how we lead, but we all know that we all do want to lead and we want to do the best things that we can. And that really helped us to um, bring new ideas to the table in which to help others, because that was what we all had in common, that we wanted to help others and make change of the school. So just knowing that we were able to use our differences to go with new ideas and strengthen what we're doing to make it the best possible. Yeah, and to add on to that, because we worked with each other four days out of the week, like, we were spending a lot of time with each other and got used to each other's, like, ways of leadership and ways you wanted to do things, and it's just, it was kind of crazy how we all came together and didn't know each other, and now I have, like, five of my really close friends, so, who I love leading with, so, yeah. So, I think this next question is a great, um, kind of tie on to that, so, what have been really your strengths and challenges um, of having all of you leaders with, um, with different personalities, different experiences, um, different ideas um, coming together to work on projects? And, you're, and you have different projects as well. So, like, what are the strengths and challenges of that? And how do you support each other um, and to ensure that each of your projects is successful? I think a big part of that is that we we are all so different, but like Carter said, we do all have the same goal in mind, and because we've become so close, we feel really comfortable asking each other for help, and I think we have a great like network of support uh, within our group. So I think um, a lot of the times we're, we all have an individual project, project but everyone's kind of helping on everything at the same time because even though one person can specialize in one thing we can't do the product completely on our own because we need the support from our, our peers with other different leadership styles so. oh, um, oh sorry i already even know you <laughs> okay <laughs> but, you know, Mr. Artie is on you. Okay, so to add on, I would just say the fact that we are so close and we are so different. I feel like everyone's a little bit um, more comfortable challenging each other and just giving different perspectives on an idea. And we all see different either um, potential successes or different potential pitfalls. So I think it's just a lot better having such a different group of people who are also close. Hey, yo, you going to say something, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add that uh, we also come up with all the ideas for these projects together. So, like, it's not like one person says, I want to do this, and then they just go off and, you know, work on it on their own. Like, we're all brainstorming together, and we all, like, ask each other for, like, suggestions, or, or if, like, hit a wall with something in our project, we can, you know, get help from somebody else. Like, we're always constantly talking to each other about all our you know, individual project. So ultimately everybody's pretty involved with everything. Mm -hmm. 
So, Julie, I think um, I have a couple of little more um, I think questions that maybe you should answer. Is there um, a, any kind of formal or informal assessment um, of the leadership skills um, that you're conducting? And also, can you talk a little bit how um, the, is there any monitoring of documents or websites to ensure the safety of the students who are participating? So I um, I do my best to monitor, um, and I have a great deal of, of trust with these young people. And we've had um, some uh, uh, conversations about what's appropriate and how we need to be the face of 212. We are the face of leaders uh, of the, the high school. What was the first part of your question? Um, um, assessment? Yes. Um, well, in terms of, and, and that's something that's important in the progress monitoring, which is another one of those standards of quality service learning. At the very beginning of our year, we set some um, goals and we had some ideas of what it was that each young person wanted to achieve as being a leader. So we will be revisiting that. This class is not a graded class. It is um, a, a, a class that is, um, they do because they want to be a part of it. Uh, so there, I, I'm not doing any assessments, and I don't ever want to be at a point where I'm saying, well, you're a leader, uh, an A leader, and you're a C leader. I mean, we're all about developing um, leadership uh, strengths and, and uh, addressing some of our, uh, how we want to be a, a better leader. One of the uh, people mentioned the leadership compass. If that's a fabulous tool to talk about how, what kind of strengths we bring to the table. And we have used that a lot. In fact, when we identified what kind of leader we were, we, we had some people come up with some of the young people come in and say, I've got to get this task done. I need a, I need a West leader. So if you haven't checked out the leadership compass, um, that's a, a great tool to help with your, with your young people when you're building leadership skills. I encourage you to visit nylc.org to access a handbook that walks you through the virtual steps that 212 took to address the issue that they were concerned about, the impact of social isolation. Go to www.nylc.org. You'll also, um, at the top corner of this page, you'll see the membership options. You can begin by subscribing, which is free, or becoming a member to the Service Learning Network. By subscribing, you'll receive The Leader, which is a monthly newsletter and special announcements. You'll be able to view the service learning resource page, download sponsored documents, and even track your clock hours for NYLC events online with this free subscriber account. You'll also be able to access the handbook for online service learning, which focuses on health and well-being one of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. By becoming a member, you'll have access to member-only webinars and all education, educator tools that will help your service learning practice and experiences. And again, don't forget, if you want to get an update on 212's actions, reach out to me at jrbascom at nylc.org. I'd love to hear how you are engaging in service learning. With that, um, Ari and um, Margo are going to talk a little bit about the last step. Okay. Emily, do you want to start us off? You're, you're muted. Oh. Sorry. Um, we've been trying to stick to our normal routines and in our meetings, and what we usually do. Um, what we usually do in our meetings in person is finish off with a quote. Um, and our partner, Julie, has a bunch of flags from all around the world in her office. So we usually like to pick one of those flags from a country and then do a quote that kind of ties in with the theme of that day. So I believe that um, our quote for today is from Austria, and we chose the theme of resilience. And Ari is usually the one who reads those quotes, so I'll hand it off to him. All right, thank you. So, um, this quote is from Radicale, and it goes, No matter how bleak 
on it as an intrusion opinion. It is not entirely on us. It can take away our freedom to respond, our power to take action. Fabulous. That's how we end our. Uh, that's how we end our our meetings, both um, online and in person. I want to thank all of you for joining us. This was a, a great opportunity, and um, it, I also want to a deep thank you to this two twelve group. Um, they show me, they demonstrated what leadership is, looks like, and um, I am very honored to be their partner. Thank you, guys. We look forward to seeing you all at uh, future uh, webinars. Uh, check out our website, nylc.org, uh, for future uh, webinars coming up. Again, thank you so much.